Welcome to this YouTube channel. In this video we are going to talk about top 10 facts about the Peacock Throne, Takt e Tavors. So before starting this video like this video, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for future updates. The Peacock Throne was a magnificent jeweled throne in India, that served as the seat of the Mughal emperors. It was commissioned by Emperor Shah Jahan in the early 17th century, and was housed in the Red Fort's Diwan i Khas, Hall of Private Audiences, or Minister's Room. It was named after a peacock since it has two peacocks dancing at its back. Here are the 10 facts about it. Number 10. Shah Jahan governed during the Mughal Empire's Golden Age, which spanned practically the entirety of the Indian subcontinent. He reigned from Shah Jahanabad, the newly built capital. The emperor, who gave audiences and received petitioners, was the center around which everything else revolved. The emperor's court was to be a miniature version of paradise on earth, located in the heart of the empire, and such a ruler would be deserving of a throne of Solomon to emphasize his status as a fair ruler. The peacock throne was to be draped in gold and jewels, with steps leading up to it, and the king hovering above earth and closer to heaven, just like Solomon's throne. The creation of this new throne was entrusted to Said Gilani, and his imperial goldsmiths department workers. The project took seven years to finish. Large amounts of real gold, precious stones, and pearls were used to create a brilliant piece of Mughal craftsmanship, that had never been exceeded before or since. It was an expensive luxury that only a select group of courtiers, nobles, and visiting dignitaries were allowed to witness. Even by Golden Age Mughal standards, the throne was opulent, costing twice as much as the Taj Mahal's construction. Number 9. After Shah Jahan's death, his son Aurangzeb assumed the peacock throne under the regnal name Alamgir. Aurangzeb was the last of the Mughal rulers who ruled for a long time. His son Bahadur Shah the first reigned from 1707 until 1712 after his death in 1707. By keeping a permissive religious policy, Bahadur Shah the first was able to keep the empire intact. Nevertheless, following his death, the empire began to fall apart. A succession of weak emperors followed a period of political instability, military setbacks, and court intrigues, Jahandar Shah ruled for one year from 1712 to 1713, Farooq Sia from 1713 to 1719, Rafi Ud Darajit and Shah Jahan II just for a few months in 1719. Mughal power was in serious decline and the empire was weak when Muhammad Shah came to power. Nonetheless, because to Muhammad Shah's great sponsorship, Delhi's court became a beacon of art and culture once more. However, administrative improvements were unable to prevent the ensuing Mughal Maratha Wars, which decimated the imperial armies. It was just a matter of time until forces from Persia sensed an opportunity to invade. Number 8. Many beautiful jewels had arrived into the imperial jewel house throughout the years, each of which could be used as an eardrop for Venus or adorn the sun's girdle. Upon the emperor's ascension, it came to him that, in the eyes of wise men, the purchase of such rare jewels, and the preservation of such magnificent brilliance can only serve one purpose, to beautify the throne of the empire. They should therefore be put to such good use that all who see them can enjoy, and profit from their beauty, and majesty can shine brighter. Number 7. It was thus ordered that, in addition to the imperial jewels, rubies, garnets, diamonds, rich pearls, and emeralds worth 200 lakhs of rupees be brought for the emperor's inspection, and that they, together with some exquisite jewels of great weight, exceeding 50,000 miskals, and worth 86 lakhs of rupees, be handed over to the emperor. 1 lakh tolas of pure gold, equivalent to 250,000 miskals in weight, and 14 lakhs of rupees in value, were also to be delivered to him. Number 6. The throne was to be three gaz long, two and a half wide, and five high, and it was to be encrusted with the aforementioned gems. The canopy's exterior would be enamel work with a few gems, the interior would be richly studded with rubies, garnets, and other jewels, and it would be supported by twelve emerald columns. There were to be two peacocks thick set with stones on top of each pillar, and a tree set with rubies and diamonds, emeralds and pearls between each pair of peacocks. Three steps were to be adorned with beautiful water diamonds as part of the ascent. Number 5. This throne was built over a seven-year period at a cost of 100 lakhs of rupees. The center one, designed for the emperor's seat, cost 10 lakhs of rupees out of the 11 jeweled recesses, takta, built around it for cushions. A diamond worth a lakh of rupees was among the gems set in this recess, which Shah, Abbas, the monarch of Iran, had presented to the late Emperor Jahangir, who sent it to his present majesty, the Sahib Kiran Isani, when he conquered the Dakin. 
Number 4. The names of Sahib Kiran, Timur, Mir Shah Rukh, and Mirza Ulu Beg were inscribed on it. When it came into the hands of Shah, Abbas, his name was added, and when it came into the ownership of Jahangir, he added his and his father's names. The name of his most glorious majesty Shah Jahan has now been added to it. The emperor ordered that the following Masnawi, written by Haji Muhammad Jan, and containing the date in the final verse, be inscribed on the interior of the canopy in green enamel letters. Number 3. After Nadir Shah possessed the original, the Mughal emperor was given a new throne. Nadir had also brought the magnificent Koh-i Noor and Daya-i Noor diamonds to Persia, where some became part of the Persian crown jewels and others were sold to the Ottomans. Nadir's loot was so large that he decided to forego paying taxes for three years. The sun throne, which is also part of the Persian crown jewels, may have been converted from the lower half of the peacock throne. There are several 19th century Indian paintings depicting this later throne. It was housed in the Diwan i Khas and was maybe smaller than the original. However, based on either the original blueprints or memory and eyewitness testimonies, the appearance would have been comparable. The replacement throne was adorned with valuable and semi-precious stones and was composed of gold or plated gold. It had 12 columns, much like the original. The columns supported a Bengali Duchala roof with two peacock, statues on each end wearing pearl necklaces in their beaks, as well as two peacocks at the top bearing pearl necklaces in their beaks. The two lower peacocks were in the center, either beneath a jewel-encrusted flower arrangement or a royal umbrella. A canopy constructed of valuable and colorful fabric, as well as gold and silver threads, shielded the throne. The canopy was supported by four metal-thin columns or beams. Colorful and valuable carpets were spread out beneath the throne. Number 2. Tavernier was given permission to examine the throne and its gems up, and personal, and he provided the most complete description of the throne to date. Tavernier described how the ballast rubies, emeralds, diamonds, and pearls were positioned on the four horizontal bars joining the four vertical legs, from which the twelve vertical columns supporting the canopy sprang, in his description. A big cabochon-cut ballast ruby was set in the center of each bar, flanked by four emeralds making a square cross. Smaller square crosses ran the length of the bar on either side of the central giant cross, but were positioned so that one square cross had a ballast ruby in the center, surrounded by four emeralds, while the next square cross had an emerald in the middle, surrounded by four ballast rubies. The emeralds were table cut, and the spaces between the emerald and ruby crosses were filled with diamonds, that were also table cut and weighed no more than 10 to 12 carats. Number 1. On the throne, there were three cushions or pillows. The one behind the emperor's back was enormous and circular, while the other two were flat and set at his sides. Gems were also strewn throughout the pillows. Tavernier mentioned some royal standards and weapons dangling from the throne, including a mace, a sword, and a circular shield, as well as a bow and quiver with arrows, all of which were studded with gemstones. On the throne, he counted the huge ballast rubies and emeralds. On the throne, there were 108 enormous ballast rubies, all cabochon cut, with the smallest weighing roughly 100 carats and the largest weighing over 200 carats. On the throne, he counted 116 enormous emeralds, all of great color, but with several imperfections, a characteristic of emeralds, the smallest weighing around 30 carats and the largest approximately 60 carats. The canopy's bottom was encrusted with diamonds and pearls, with a pearl fringe all around. A diamond weighing 80 to 90 carats was suspended from the side of the throne facing the court, surrounded by rubies and emeralds. This hung arrangement of jewels was in full view in front of the emperor, when he was seated on the throne. Tavernier went on to describe two massive gem-studded royal umbrellas, that were not attached to the throne but were placed four feet apart on either side of it. Diamonds, rubies, and pearls adorned the core stems of these umbrellas, which were seven to eight feet long. The umbrella's material was made of red velvet, and was embroidered and trimmed with pearls all around. The height of these umbrellas may have given an idea of the throne's height, which was most likely the same. As a result, the throne would have been about 7 to 10 feet tall. Must visit Irwin Aviation for interesting and amazing videos, and also subscribe Irwin Aviation for amazing videos. What do you think about this? Do let us know down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video and want to hear from us again, be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go.